Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you this day from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I once knew a man, and I'll call him Jeff, who had spent 10 years waiting on the transplant list to receive a new heart. Jeff had experienced four heart attacks, underwent three angioplasties, was living with a diagnosis of coronary artery disease, existed in a state of constant fatigue, lived by the help of a ventricular assistance device, a a device that had been planted in his chest to help with its daily function. He took more medications than he could keep track of, and despite being one of the highest names on the donor and the national registry list, he had a blood type that was so rare that it was all but certain that he wouldn't find a heart to match before he succumbed to his circumstances. Jeff often said that waiting for a heart transplant was one of the hardest things that he had ever done in his life, but not nearly as hard as waiting to reconcile with his estranged family who had walked out on him. You see, for most of his life, Jeff had been an alcoholic and over the years had run off his wife and his children and his siblings and anyone who had ever cared about him as he struggled with the bottle And after getting clean and sober for the final time, and after overcoming his addiction, Jeff set out to make his wrongs right, only to find that those that he had pushed away during those ugly years wanted nothing to do with him. Now, as he was so close to getting a new heart, he could taste it. All he wanted to do was fix the heart he had destroyed and mend it, those relationships that had gone down in the process. But, and I know I don't have to tell any of you this, relationships are messy. And Jesus starts laying that out in our gospel text this morning, which, by the way, is not one of my favorite teachings of Christ's, especially when it comes from a Jesus who seems to us to be out of character, a Jesus who seems to be heavy-handed. These verses comprise the third installment of Jesus' famous sermon on the mount, and they come right on the heels of last week's gospel text, wherein Jesus refers to you, his people, as salt and light, plainly saying that because you belong to him, you are these things, and he will use you as such. But this morning, we say, take me back to that gospel text, because that's the Jesus I want to hear more from. Take me back to the Jesus at the beginning of the Sermon of the Mount, who is pronouncing blessings on the poor in spirit, the mourning, the meek, the merciful. Give me more of that Jesus, because the Jesus we have here in this morning's gospel text is not affirming or coddling me. I don't like this Jesus very much. And when we confront this text in this way, we are liable to do one of two things, or we are liable to read this text in one of two ways— First, as the law on steroids, or second, as an escape from the law altogether. You see, it would be very easy to read this text as Jesus taking the law, raising the standards, holding us up to something new, a new bar, and telling us to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and adhere to these fresh moral principles that he's laying out. After all, six times Jesus says what the law requires, and then he adds, but I say to you, and he seems to amplify it even more. You think murdering is only taking someone's life? No. Murdering is also holding a grudge. Murder and face the wrath of God. Lust after a woman and face damnation. Utter a false word towards your neighbor and risk your eternal reward so we kick it into hyperdrive and we become the Pharisees Jesus so vehemently detested, striving to keep every law handed down by Moses plus the 600 plus other ones the religious leaders of Israel had added to keep you on track. But on the other hand, it would be just as easy to read this text and say, well, Obviously, what Jesus is doing here is making the law so impossible to achieve, raising the bar so high and making it so unreachable that we don't even have to worry about keeping it at all. In this kind of reading of this morning's gospel text, we would say, well, Jesus doesn't really mean that we can't have an argument with our neighbor or that we can't 
look at the nice-looking ladies on the strip club billboards on the side of the highway, or we can't tell a white lie every now and then because it might be there to protect someone we love. Furthermore, if we are saved by grace and not works, if we are saved apart from the law, why would we keep it anyway? And no matter which way we want to read it, as hyperlaw or no law at all, we are trying to make it work on our behalf. So on one hand, we say, I've kept these laws the best that I can, but there are people who break them way worse than I have. We say, sure, I have may have let my eyes wander off of my wife a little bit, but that's a far cry from adultery. I haven't acted on those intentions. I do the best that I can, and God will reward me for my effort. And on the other hand, we might say, well, everyone sins, so why does it matter? Everyone lies, everyone cheats on their taxes a little, everyone hates someone, everyone lusts after the opposite sex. Why would God single me out? No matter how we read this gospel text, and no matter how you want to hear it, what we're going to do is always try to justify our sin. Which is exactly why Jesus' words cut through us like a knife. It isn't that Jesus was adding something to the law that wasn't there, or expanding it to include new elements for the first time. Rather, what Jesus is doing is cutting all of the loopholes that we want to climb through to expose something in us that we would rather keep hidden away. We need a Savior. We have sinned and fall short of God's glory. We are unrighteous. We break God's commands daily. Our efforts to do God's will are subpar, and we miss the mark. Jesus clips away through so many of the Ten Commandments and expounds on them, particularly Commandments 5, 6, and 8. And he repeats us again what he told us in last week's Gospel text. Unless your ability to follow these commands exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will be least in the kingdom of heaven. In fact, if you think that you can enter the kingdom of heaven based on how well you keep these laws, you won't enter it at all. As easy as it would be to read these laws and try to whip ourselves into shape and try to make them count towards our eternal destiny, the fact of the matter is this text isn't really about our hands or our feet or our eyes getting us into trouble. Jesus isn't so much concerned with the external as he is with our hearts. In the days before the flood, it says in Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. Like King David as he gazed from his balcony on the Bathsheba bathing on her roof, our hearts want what they can't have. Our hearts lead us astray. Our hearts are corrupted and have been since Satan deceived Adam and Eve in the garden. And we cannot fix our hearts on our own. So where does that leave us? It leaves us in need of a heart transplant. Like my friend Jeff And like King David, who as we read this morning in the psalm, had to pray, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew my spirit. And this is what you have come here to do today, dear friends. You've come to receive clean hearts. You've sauntered into your pews, confessing yourselves to be unworthy sinners. You've walked into this sanctuary to know that your abilities to follow the law are futile. You've come here to acknowledge your sin and unload your guilt and receive only the words that can make your heart new. Are you ready for them? The words that give you a clean and a pure heart and now on the account of Jesus Christ and by his authority alone, the entirety of all your sins are forgiven. Even though you are unrighteous, Jesus isn't. Even though you are imperfect, Jesus is not. And in the waters of your baptism and through faith, Jesus' righteousness and his perfection are transferred to you. And when God looks at you and when God sees you, he sees not a sinner, but he looks at you through the lens of his cross. 
standing before him clothed in the white robe of Jesus' obedience, suffering, death, and resurrection. So that means that keeping the law is optional, right, Pastor? Wrong. But our motivation for keeping the law is different. Because God does not hold his anger toward us, but reserved his wrath for his son Jesus Christ at Golgotha, we are called to let go of anger and the grudges we are holding against even those who have wronged us. Because God has made us his prized possession and diverts not his gaze from us and lusts after us only, we are called to be faithful in our relationships. Because God has not lied when he said, I love you, you are mine, I have claimed you as my own, we too are called to be honest and faithful and truthful with our speech. Paul says in Galatians 3.24 that the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So now justified completely through faith, the law no longer being our guardian and the law no longer able to accuse us or chastise us or make us right with God, the law now shows us the needs of our neighbors. And he shows us what living as salt and light looks like. My friend Jeff did finally, by the way, receive his heart transplant. And this freed him and gave him more time to reconcile with his family, which he did. And so too, dear friends, upon hearing God's love and forgiveness for us, vile sinners, we too have received new clean, pure hearts. Hearts that are free now to live for those in our lives. Amen.